Mr. Anu, yes, Pillai. I have been, I know him for uh, uh, at least two decades now. But this is the last three years, he has stunned me. The one word is, I am unable to believe <coughs> that uh, a young boy who is uh, B.A. Economics uh, can enter into a totally different area has become one of the most respected historians of <coughs> India. Just to see his book, Ivory, for how big is this, and it is, <coughs> it has already received a Sahitya Academy Award of India. This
That is Mr. Bhavi Yatpale. May I now call upon stage Dr. Biju G. Pillai, Director, IT and Admission, to formally introduce our guest for this great evening. Friends, my job is to introduce a great researcher. Even though it is written there uh, as an author, but he is a great researcher first of all. So me and one of our senior students, we did a small research on this great researcher today in the morning and we made a small movie. While making this, uh, doing this research, I realized so many new things about him. Even though it is a very smaller one, if I wanted to prepare one uh, movie on him, it will at least take an hour to include the various achievements he have achieved in his life.
So while going through the various uh, articles and other things, I realized that Manu is not only able to write history things, better contemporary things as well. Even about the recent, one of the recent article which he has written, it is talking about the history of football in India. With this, I welcome uh, Manu. The floor is all yours. Well, thank you, Bala sir, to begin with, because um, it's quite special for me to hear him say all these wonderful things about me because I grew up knowing him as Bala uncle. And I remember my first meeting with him was when I was about uh, seven years old. And we went uh, to an apartment, a penthouse he was staying in at the time. And our first meeting wasn't entirely glamorous for me because he had this massive uh, German shepherd in those days. And this dog started chasing me and I decided to cry. So that's how we were introduced for the first time. Uh, you know, Dr. Biju, of course, is my second cousin. And uh, he knew me, obviously, from the time I was three years old. And uh, when I was about 10, he used to have a motorbike on which I used to sit in the front and, you know, pretend I was the one in charge. So both these people have seen me in my previous avatars when I was pretty much, you know, just another kid. And now to hear them, uh, I don't know, shower me with such uh, words and kind sentiments is obviously a very special moment for me as well. So thank you, uh, everybody here, Bala sir in particular, all the faculty members for attending and not least all of you, because I do know that uh, you've had classes since 8 o'clock in the morning. So after a very taxing, grueling day, you're here again. I promise not to inflict a very long sermon on you, and I'll try and keep this as interesting as possible. Now, why is it that I, I mean, I'm going to talk mainly about why I do history, why I'm interested in history. On the one hand, if you look at the way history is taught in this country, it's always a sequence of events. First you learn there were the Guptas or the, there were the Vedas before them, then there were these empires, there was Ashoka, then there were the Guptas, oh and then Muslim invaders came, you know, there was a problem there, then the British came, and it's this linear narrative of one thing leading to the next in the most boring, uninteresting fashion possible ever. But then I realized that at the end of the day, what is it that interests human beings? It's the stories of other human beings. Why is it that we are so obsessed with selfies? Why is it that we're so obsessed with the stories of, I don't know, film stars, of people around us? Because human beings connect with other human beings. It's essentially a basic fodder for any uh, human interaction. You need to know what other people are doing and you, you have an interest in what other people are doing. Which means that if you start looking at history, not as a sequence of dates, not as a, a collection of battles, but as a play of human beings, a play of personalities, you know, interesting characters with whom you might have a lot in common than you realize. You might be separated by, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight centuries, but for all you know, you might be uh, connected with them on a completely different plane. So if you look at the cover of my first book here, why did I choose to write about Kerala? It wasn't because I was a Malayali. I can't read or write Malayalam, but I can speak the language. But if you look at the two women here, for me, they exemplify a very fascinating period and a fascinating play of personalities that can tell us a lot about history, about that particular period, about ourselves as well. Now, one remarkable thing that struck me was the society of Kerala for a very long time was matrilineal. So here's a thing you never learn in textbooks. Here's a, a bit of history that you never come across if you're reading your regular humdrum historical material. So now, for example, a family is man, wife, and children, you know, father, mother, and kids. And you think, you know, everywhere across the world, across India, this is how it's been. But this family in Travancore was actually very different. It was matrilineal, which meant that succession was in the line of the women. So when the Maharaja's wife was not the Maharani, the Maharaja's sister was the Maharani. To become a Maharaja, it didn't matter who the hell your father was. It mattered who your mother was. You had to be born from a Maharani to inherit the throne. The Maharani's husband was merely con called the consort. He wasn't even called the husband. He could not sit in the presence of his wife. He had to remain standing in the presence of his wife. He could not call his wife by name. He had to call his wife, Your Highness. Even his visits to his wife's bedroom was only if she invited him. Otherwise, he had no place in the palace. He had to live in an outhouse. Uh, when they went out, they couldn't sit in the same carriage or the same car. And if by some accident they ended up in the same car, it was essential that he sat opposite her, not next to her, because to sit next to her meant you were her equal. 
but if you're opposite her, you're still her subject. The funniest is that when there were banquets and feasts in the palace, uh, the Maharani and her children would be served four desserts and her husband would be served two desserts. Because this was a parallel universe and it existed till 1949. This matrilineal dynasty ruling in Kerala existed till 1949. But not many people know it. Not many people in Kerala know it. In my own family, you know, in the 1880s, I had a great-great-grandmother who was a divorcee. Because, where, say, for example, in the north of India, you have polygamy, where a man can have more than one wife. In Kerala, we had polyandry, where a woman could have more than one husband. But, again, this is not something you learn. Divorce was a perfectly normal, you know, uh, affair in those days. If you weren't getting along with your husband, well, it was good for both of you to split. It wasn't such a big deal. Um, you know, so the, the entire slice of history that you see in Kerala, in this one state alone, tells you so much that you didn't know, tells you so much that it challenges these notions and prejudices and preconceptions you have about the past, and you discover that there's a whole new parallel universe over there that we know nothing about. I mean, Kerala we see now as the land of communism, but what was it, say, when the Portuguese sailed in? The Portuguese, I mean, we like to think that Europe sort of discovered India, but it didn't. India was always trading with the world. You know, there was a Pallava emperor in the 8th century. You know, they, they didn't have heirs in the Pallava empire. So the Brahmins decided, now what do we do? Where do we find a future king? Then they looked into the genealogy of the Pallava royal family, which is in Kanchipuram in Tamil Nadu. And they discovered that one prince had got on a ship and gone off to Cambodia or Vietnam or one of those countries and married a princess there. So these Brahmins also got on a ship, went all the way to Vietnam, and they discovered that this man had a descendant living there. They found a 12-year-old boy, descended from this Pallava king, and in the 8th century, they imported this Southeast Asian boy to Kanchivaram in Tamil Nadu and installed him as the Pallava emperor. So in a time when we are grappling with things like who is Indian, who is a foreigner, who is an outsider, which religion belongs here, which doesn't belong here, we realize that if you look at history, we are all outsiders, we are all minorities, we all came from somewhere. Some of our greatest emperors were born ab uh, abroad and you know, in different places. I was just talking to uh, the faculty in, the, in, 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 in a room inside, and we were talking about um, how uh, the, the Persian connection, the Zoroastrians came to India. We call them Parsis now, but they were Zoroastrians who lived in Persia. Uh, how Al Ashoka, Emperor Ashoka's family, Chandragupta Maurya, had a Greek wife. I mean, these are not things you necessarily connect when we have these narrow conversations about history and when history is only about a matter of dates. It's about these textures. History is about layers. It's not this happened and then that happened. It ha it's about a journey. It's about a process. And that is what I'm interested in investigating. Um, little things you realize about the way this country was shaped. If you look at all our textbooks, they bring it down to this grand moment of nationalism. But even the national, nationalist struggle had so many personalities, so many clashing moments, so many different types of currents that was actually guiding it. You know, Mahatma Gandhi was one kind of force. Nehru had a socialist uh, perspective. Sadar Patel had a different perspective altogether, and he was friends with capitalists. So you discover that it was all these parallel things that together made history. It was never one man. It was never one woman. It was the people. It was a series of ideas. It was a series of flows that made history. And that is what we are all part of. We are all part of a much bigger journey. I mean, I'm not saying this in a romanticized way. We are all part of a much bigger, you know, course that the society has been traveling across time and across large spans that we don't necessarily recognize in the here and now. And, you know, you realize that you have to challenge a lot of uh, preconceptions that you're born with. For example, in my current new book, which uh, there's, it, it's available outside a few copies on discount if you want to buy it, why was I interested in the Deccan? We all know the story of Shivaji. We know that Shivaji stood up from the Deccan, established a new kingdom and a new empire. The Deccan was the place where the Mughals came and essentially it became the graveyard of the Mughal empire. But is that all? Like, was that all there was to the Deccan? It wasn't. So if you look at this particular picture, for example, I don't know if you can see it clearly. In the front is one of the Adil Shahs of Bijapur. He was a uh, a king there. And Bijapur is now pretty much a provincial town. Nobody will think that till the 17th century it was one of the world's greatest cities with hundreds of thousands of people, Dutch, Chinese, Burmese, the kind of people who came there, the kind of people who were attracted to Bijapur. If you go there now, you won't see it. But the man in the front, who is uh, the Adil Shah of Bijapur, look at his ancestry. In the 16th century, a man showed up from Persia, got off a ship somewhere in Goa, one of those places, came off uh, into what was then the Bahmani Sultanate. 
married a Maratha woman and produced a new dynasty that established itself in Bijapur. So on the one hand, you have a Persian man coming to Maharashtra. You have a Maratha lady of high birth who's involved. And they've created a Shia Muslim dynasty where you have characters like this gentleman on the right. One of his descendants was a man called Ibrahim Adil Shah, the second. Why was Ibrahim so interesting? He used to call, his name was Ibrahim. He called himself a devout Muslim. But he also called himself the son of Guru Ganapati and the pure Saraswati. He was obsessed with Hindu gods. He used to wear the Rudraksh Mala. He used to paint his nails red and have himself painted like that in portraits and miniatures. He was so interested in the goddess Saraswati that he went to the extent of calling Bijapur Vidyapur because he wanted to rename the city after the goddess Saraswati. He, he, he patronized a European artist. He had artists coming in from the Far East. He had um, uh, one horse trader went to see him and was astonished that he met this gentleman in a court surrounded by 500 women on Venus, all of them bejeweled and playing the South Indian musical instrument. He imported architectural styles from Tamil areas. He was living in a, a Marathi do dominated area. When the Mughals came, you know, they sent an envoy and an ambassador to see him. And the ambassador was struck because in those days, the, uh, the language that they used for diplomacy was Persian. But this gentleman, descended from a Persian and a Maratha lady, chose the Marathi side of his family because he was more comfortable in Marathi. He wrote in Marathi. He was interested in Maharashtrian culture. His favorite wife was a Maharashtrian lady. So again, you realize that this man, some people would categorize him simply as a Muslim king. But there was so much more to him. He was, there were these layers to him that we don't necessarily realize. Again, in this picture, look at the back. There's a much darker gentleman sitting at the back on the same elephant. Why is he dark? Not because he's a, a, a dark-skinned Indian. It's because he's an African. We know that, you know, say Persians came to India. Okay, fine. But how many people know that this very Maharashtra that we're sitting in now attracted, till the 16th century, thousands of Africans every year? They used to come here as military slaves. And this is a long tradition. For example, in the uh, 14th century in Uttar Pradesh, if there's anybody from Uttar Pradesh here, there's a place called Jonpur, where an African eunuch established a kingdom that existed for 100 years. In Bengal, in the late 15th century, there, were, there was another African dynasty, the Hapshi dynasty, that ruled in Bengal. Similarly, in the Deccan, there was this, it became a magnet for African military experts who used to come here, and they were the ones who actually guided the destiny of this land. We never learn it. We learn, I mean, Shivaji is a very important character, so we learn about it, but a lot of the characters from before get ignored because he's such a towering figure. So the smaller characters before are forgotten. There was this guy called Malik Ambar. Malik Ambar began his life in Ethiopia, in what is called the Oromo tribe. From the Oromo tribe, he was captured as a boy of, say, 10 years old and taken to Baghdad. From Baghdad, he was sold and brought to the Deccan, to India, where he was purchased as one of 1,000 slaves by the Peshwa of Ahmednagar. Ahmednagar is another city in Maharashtra. But this Peshwa, the prime minister of Ahmednagar, was himself a black man from Africa who had risen to such power in India that he had a thousand slaves under him. And Malik Ambar was one of them. In the course of his life, Malik Ambar tied up with the Marathas. He had leading Marathas, including Shivaji's grandfather, as his close associates. Shivaji, in fact, respected him to the extent that in the Shiva Bharata composed in Shivaji's court, Malik Ambar is called as brave as the sun because even much later, the memory of Malik Ambar was so dominant in Maharashtra. Malik Ambar then got his daughter, so think of this, this is a black African lady born to an African slave who then gets married to the Sultan of Ahmednagar. And he was not the first Sultan of Ahmednagar uh, to have uh, an African wife. There was an earlier Sultan also who had an African wife. And the Sultans themselves, although they were Muslims, they were descended from Brahmins. So again you realize that in Ahmednagar you have this microcosm of the world itself, it's a mirror of the world itself, where you have Africans in court, you have Marathas in court, you have South Indians in court, you have people of Persian descent, you have descendants of Brahmins, and you have a black queen as well. And these are the things we don't, these are little details of history that we don't necessarily learn, that we don't necessarily understand. Malik Ambar was such a successful uh, military general that Emperor Jahangir and Akbar hated him and they were reduced to barking insults at him because they, were ne they could never vanquish him on the battlefield. Uh, Jahangir went to the extent of having a painting commissioned which very grandly shows Jahangir standing on a globe like this great king holding up an arrow and a bow and shooting the bow at uh, Malik Ambar's severed head. The head is on a, on a stick. 
except that this never happened. This was a fantasy in the Mughal emperor's mind which he could never actually accomplish. Malik Ambar died and he was buried in uh, Khuldabad where his tomb is still a magnificent structure. And if you go to a small city like Khuldabad, you will see it and you'll realize that this small little town in rural Maharashtra actually was once upon a time one of those seats of history where great events played out, where history itself was made. Close to Khuldabad, you go to this Elora, where the caves are obviously famous. And you uh, find these very Islamic looking structures with domes and so on. And normally, uh, many scholars have been confused and they've actually said that these are Muslim tombs. But if you actually consider those, uh, those buildings carefully, you'll realize that they're, they're not Muslim tombs, they're Samadhis of Shivaji's grandfather Maluji and his brother. Now many people, especially some political parties, like to take a historical figure like Shivaji and turn him into a, a mascot for Hindutva, for example. But the man was much more than that. He was not the sum of his religion alone. He was a very interesting man who had layers and various facets to him. And in this dichotomy that Shivaji equal to Hindu, Aurangzeb equal to Muslim, they forget that this structure, Shivaji's grandfather was a close associate of a Muslim sultan. His father was a close associate of a Muslim sultan. His mother's family even served the Mughals briefly. Uh, Aurangzeb had plenty of Rajput blood in him. And this sort of complicates these linear narratives that we build in history because all these linear narratives come with certain political agendas. So people like me, what we're trying to do with fairly exhaustive research, with fairly uh, demanding uh, you know, requirements on our time and the cost of our sleep, is to resurrect these old stories in all their detail, in all their breathtaking majesty, in all their richness, and to tell, you, tell readers, especially young readers, that it is not a black and white story. History is not about this happened and then that happened. It's about these constant forces at play, creating something so special and unique that we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we did not completely uh, respect and learn to admire these stories that have so much in common with us. Globalization is a word, a word that's bandied about a lot. But globalization is not a new phenomenon. It's not something in its current avatar with its current technology and so on. Of course, it's a 20th and 21st century affair. But globalization existed for thousands of years. Why is it that when St. Thomas, who was Jesus' direct disciple, came in 52 AD to Kerala, when he got off his boat, what he first saw was a flute playing Jewish girl because the Jews had already come to Kerala. Why is it that there was a half Chinese, half Malayali community in Calicut? Uh, why is it that, you know, so many internationalists, why is it that Firoz Shah Bahamani, for example, had Afghan women in his harem? He had a wife who had come off from Europe. He had a wife from China. He spoke all these languages because the world was always interconnected. Human beings always talk to each other. Globalization, therefore, was not a new phenomenon. It has always been there in some form or the other. And our natural impulse, our natural instinct is to talk. Our natural instinct is to connect with other cultures, is to take lessons from the world itself. And to realize that it is these stories that really build us and build our societies. There is this um, fascinating episode about how culture can change very, very, very quickly. In Kerala, till the 1940s even, it was perfectly normal for men and women to go about topless. Even now, if you go into a temple, men have to take off their shirt. You can't enter a temple with your shirt on. Back in the day, even women used to move around like that. And it wasn't considered at all scandalous. I mean, the Europeans came and when they often met queens, they were taken aback that there were these topless women around them. But there it wasn't such a big deal because that's how the weather was. That's how people dressed. Um, we have this fascinating instance where there's this writer called Aubrey Menon. The Menon was his father, who's a Malayali. And his mother was an Irish woman, uh, one of those countries. And the first time the mother the, came with her father to meet his family, uh, she was living in this outhouse because she was white, so she wasn't allowed into the main uh, building. And uh, the grandmother sent her maid saying, Acha, now, you know, I want to see my daughter-in-law, please bring her. And the maid came running to this grandmother and said, Ayo, you know, she's sitting there and she's wearing a blouse. And the grandmother said, if she's wearing a blouse, she must be preparing for adultery. Because to wear a blouse was considered indecent. It was considered vulgar to cover yourself about the waist. That used to exist in the 1940s. The first Brahmin woman in Kerala to wear a blouse in the 1920s was excommunicated and thrown out by her community, saying you've lost your virtue because you're wearing a blouse. You know, this is a, another little detail that we don't realize. You go to Kerala now, there's nothing to suggest that this is how it was. But a little slice of India had this very completely different culture that today even Malayalis will find very, very alien. 
as I said about Maharashtra, people in Maharashtra will not realize how much their culture has been shaped by Africans, by Persians, by Sultans who were followers of Hindu gods, but Shia Muslims also, and equally devout. People don't realize the way the Northeast came into India. How is it that the Northeast came into India? The, the British wanted to connect Assam and Manipur, and they realized that there are these hills in the middle called the Naga Hills. And they said, Acha, chalo. It's just a few tribes. Let's uh, get some soldiers in and we'll just overnight take these hills for ourselves. The Nagas stood up to it then and they fought the British. They fought the British all the way till 1947. And when the British government was replaced by the independent Indian government, the Naga tribes said, look, we, we never recognized the British authority over us. Why should we recognize your authority? And that insurgency has still been going on. So each part of this country has a unique story to tell. Each part of this country has these fascinating figures. Every temple, every building, every mosque has a, a, an exquisite story. In Calicut, there's this mosque called the Mishkal Mosque. If you look at it from the outside, it is not like any mosque you've seen. It doesn't have a dome. It doesn't have minarets. It looks like a Hindu temple. It's got gables, a tile roof, a lot of woodwork. It looks like any other Hindu structure from that er area. At one point, the Portuguese, Portuguese came into Calicut and they were you know, fighting a war against the Zamorin of Calicut. And they went and destroyed this mosque because they wanted to expel all the Muslims from that trading center. And uh, the Hindu Zamorin of Calicut, 70 years later, when he won over the Portuguese, when he destroyed their fort, he actually picked up the wood from their fort, came back and built the mosque again in the old style. Because people were not... Be, I mean, they were, their actions were not based on religion or other things. They had other interests, they had other identities which used to work. So this is, again, one tiny little story that you see here. In Delhi, similarly, you have this uh, North Indian invader called Mahmud of Gore, who came in and everyone says, very bad invader because his texts talk about how he destroyed infidels. But the same Mahmud also minted coins featuring the Hindu goddess Lakshmi prominently on it because he realized that if he has to integrate with Indian society and rule Indians, he's, his coins have to be recognizable. There has to be something on the coins that the people recognize. So even someone as iconoclastic as him had to bring on a Lakshmi onto his coins because that's the world he lived in. Uh, go to a temple like Madurai and you will discover astonishing carvings on the walls of the Madurai temple. Things that... Uh, I mean, some people would even consider indecent. And the story alone challenges so many notions we have. The Madurai goddess, as per legend, was born to a king. And uh, the king said, I want a son, when he did this big yagam or whatever and threw things into the, into the fire. Instead, from the fire, what he got was a girl. And it was a triple-breasted girl. And the king said, what is this heavens? I asked for a son and you've given me a freak. You've given me a circus character who's got three breasts. But this daughter grows up into this magnificent warrior and the entire temple essentially commemorates the memory of this warrior queen who was an androgynous, not fully female, not fully masculine figure. When eventually, you know, the, the, the Vedic Brahmins got there, they realized we have to find some way of fitting her into the wider Hindu tradition. So they said, Acha, chalo, let's just invent a marriage for her with Shiva. So a new story was, come, uh, was invented there, where they said, okay, in the course of her battles and conquests, she went all the way to the Himalayas, and there she met Shiva, and she became a full woman there. They got married, and Shiva was also installed in this temple. But even now, it is the goddess who is treated more importantly. It is her festival that is more important. It is not Shiva who is the primary uh, deity there. And even when Shiva is venerated in the Madurai temple, it's not like any Shiva you've seen. He's not wearing his hides and serpents and so on. He's wearing the dress of a South Indian prince because he was indigenized. He was turned into a Tamil figure to fit into the story uh, of the Madurai temple. So you just have to look literally in your neighborhood. You look around you and you discover the stories that there are. If anybody here is from Karnataka, for example, it was the seat of this fabulous empire called the Vijayanagar Empire. What was the Vijayanagar Empire all about? People again paint this notion that Vijayanagar was a Hindu empire and the sultans of the Deccan were a Muslim uh, region. Whereas in reality, one of the emperors of Vijayanagar was actually an employee of the sultan, the Qutub Shah of Golconda, and he later went and married the previous emperor's daughter, and that's how he became an emperor. Another, the Qutub Shah himself, had spent seven years living in, in uh, Vijayanagar, where he picked up the Telugu language, married a Kannada wife, started patronizing poetry on the Mahabharata, and changed his name from Ibrahim to Malik Brahma. And he went back to his kingdom and became the Qutub Shah. The, so the kings of Vijayanagar, again, we see them as the Hindu Rayas, uh, which is the South Indianization of Raja. But they also called themselves from the 1340s as Hindu Rayas Suratrana, which is a Sanskritization that means sultans among Hindu kings. 
because they wanted to be called sultans as well. So there were not just sultans in the north, there were also Hindu sultans in Vijayanagar. Again, every e region, as I mentioned, has these remarkable stories, but we're not really making that much of an effort to go out and find them. That is why some of us, and Bala Uncle mentioned the research that I put in for my first book for six years, uh, the whole effort is to find these stories and to put them out there in an engaging, accessible style and to connect with the reader and to tell the reader that these are, these are facts, these are all based on solid archival material, it's based on inscriptions, it's based on accounts of travellers, but it's also rendered in the way that it reads like a story. You can literally melt into the story and be there yourself and discover an India that is not taught to you in schools. It's, a, it's an India that is not taught to you in your college textbooks. It's not something you pick up on the academic circuit either. It's a completely different fascinating universe that you really are melting into and becoming a part of. And the whole exercise is that we must remind ourselves constantly what a glorious tradition we come from. Especially in an age when we find it very easy to succumb to division, to succumb to very narrow formulas of what makes one person us and the other person them and how we must fight with each other. You realize that these stories are what remind you that actually you're part of something much bigger, something much greater and something that can teach you far greater things than any uh, regular textbook can teach you. So I think uh, with these few stories and without inflicting too much more on you, especially when you're all so tired, I'll end my words here. And if you have any uh, questions, I'll happily take them now, I guess. Good evening, sir. So uh, my question is regarding Harappa's civilization, which our country had witnessed, which was considered the most developed civilization during that time. So where did it go on? And how after that the complicated rituals took place in our country? So I want to know that because I was not able to find that answer. Harappa is a complicated subject because we have still not deciphered the script. So we have all their written material, but we don't know how to read it. It's a, it's a language that's been forgotten. So nobody knows how to read the Harappan thing, which is why it's one of those challenging things where a lot of it is speculation. A lot of it, one historian will have one version, someone else will have another version. That's the thing with Harappa. It was an extraordinary uh, civilization because this was one of those places, I mean, you have to remember that people were living in caves in other parts of the world and this was a planned city. They had toilets on the first floor, they had underground plumbing. That was the level of advancement they had reached and this is 3,000, 4,000 years ago. But the most con convincing argument about what destroyed Harappa now is that it was environmental change. It was the change, it was change in rainfall, it was rivers drying up, it was an urban culture that became excessively exploitative of nature, as a result of which, when nature stopped cooperating, that civilization over 1,000 years, it wasn't an overnight thing. Some people believe that invaders came in and wiped it out, which is not true, because you see that the decline was over 800, 900 years. But that was 800, 900 years of climate change, essentially, where one river, the Saraswati, entirely dried up. Uh, other rivers were changing course. All these cities became unsustainable. You had large numbers of people living there, but not enough to supply, not enough to maintain these cities. What then happens? You have social chaos. People start leaving the cities, people start fighting with each other, and we became, ironically, for, instead of a rural to urban civilization, we became an urban to rural civilization. We abandoned those cities and started going into the villages. We abandoned that earlier culture of urban life and these uh, toilets on the first floor and started living in huts where there were no toilets at all. And it's one of those tragedies of history, but again, you realize that these are cyclical tales. You know, there is an up and then there is a down, and it's happening to us again now. The, you know, the world is changing, the environment is changing, and we're not doing enough to draw the light, right lessons from history and to prevent it. We are living at this breakneck pace where in the next 500 years, uh, we may have a Harappa moment of our own where our, you know, your descendants, you all, you'll all get MBAs at the end of this and work in swanky buildings and drive fancy cars. But for all you know, your descendants will be living in villages and, you know, driving bullock carts. So my name is Ishit Shrastav. I just want to ask you a frank question that uh, we as a students always hated history in our classes because, you know, it is always, you know, it was always taught in a very monotonous way. So what changes in education system of India, you know, the, the system should change to make it more interesting and more uh, approachable and accessible? It's a, you know, difficult thing even for the government. I don't blame governments completely for writing terrible textbooks and sometimes practically hideous uh, historical narratives. Partly because we're such a massive country. We're not a one, you know, one man, one rule, homogenized country. We have like thousands of dialects. We have 
22 official recognized languages. We have each state that has a distinct culture. In, in, in one state alone, you'll find that the Marathi spoken in one place is not the same as the Marathi spoken, say, 50 kilometers down the road. So there's so much diversity that for a textbook committee, how on earth do you accommodate all this into, five, say, 50 pages? It's, it's impossible. So then they reduce history to its bare bones, like these basic dry, crummy facts of one date, okay, this happened. Another date, this happened. And they remove all the complexity simply to make it fit. The challenge then is not so much with the government, it is with others outside it who, who should then make history accessible. What often scholars fall into this trap where there's groundbreaking historical research. There are great stories coming out, but it remains in that academic circuit. You, you present something at a seminar, you give a lecture somewhere, but it stays there. Then you have people like me who are trying to bridge that. You want the latest solid research, but you also want to put it in a language that any reader can pick up and access, which is not complicated, which takes it and presents history in an attractive fashion. So that, I suppose, is the only way in which you can, you can you know, deal with this. I don't think uh, expecting the government and the authorities to do very much is a very wise choice. It is for people who have an interest in history to go out and make an enlivened history and make it an attractive subject for people. Sir, this uh, is Tanzila. Sir, my question is same as he asked. As we, uh, when we were a child, we never thought history could be so interesting and it could be so... What made you think and what made you go down so keen and get into such a wide and extent research it and was, learn about history? It was personal to be fair because, um, you know, I, in schools we'd study that, you know, widow remarriage was a great reform. You know, everybody studied it, Bengal, Ramon Roy and so on. Widow remarriage was like this thing and it was a massive moment for India. But then, you know, I'd go to Kerala to my grandmother who said, oh yeah, my grandmother, that's my, my, my great great grandmother. She had, you know, one husband, then she divorced him and married another husband. And I was like, wait, on the one hand, you have this great notion of widow and remarriage, and that's a big reform. And on the other hand, in the same country, you have a woman who had two husbands in the 19th century. So this sort of personal question got me thinking about why is there this dichotomy? Widow remarriage was something that only affected 0.5% of the population, the Brahmins. Non-Brahmins didn't really have this issue, most of them. You could, widows could often remarry. So I started thinking, wait, so we're making a sweeping generalization Whereas my own family's reality is very different. The other thing is, even in basic rituals, because we belong to what is called the Naya community, it's matrilineal. So I belong technically to my mother's family, not to my father's family. To the extent that in the old days, if my father, say, hypothetically, someone's father is on his deathbed, he would not be allowed to die in that house because he's not a member of the family. He would be lifted with his bed and taken to his own family's house to die there. His own sons would not attend his funeral because they had no business attending the father's, father's funeral. It was his sister's kids who did the funeral. Uh, Dr. Biju here is my second cousin, but in the old days, we would never have even met because we're related through our fathers and our fathers would have married their respective wives. We would have grown up in the houses of those wives and had never had any reason to meet or have any interaction with each other. So these family things and family nuances alone got me thinking about how, you know, this was such a bewildering, you know, completely bizarre environment and I decided I wanted to investigate and the moment I started investigating I discovered that wow like there's so many stories and there's no end to these stories. So, so wasn't it difficult for you to clear the myths that were going on, going on in different places? Was it difficult? That's why I spent six years on that first book because when you're putting out a book for the first time you have to be doubly cautious. You have to be very careful about what you say. You can't make a, a random sweeping statement without authority. So, you know, I ended up looking at diaries of historical figures, their love letters even, intelligence reports that the British had collected from people, uh, letters that these people had officially written to each other, archival material in Kerala, in London, in America, and a bunch of other places. I went on a quest of Raja Ravi Varma paintings because the two women in the cover of my first book are granddaughters of Raja Ravi Varma. So I did this exhaustive sort of research. And frankly, once you have the facts in front of you, it's only a question of connecting the dots. Once the dots become clear, you know how to sort of bridge that and come up with your with your story. It, it frankly comes down to how solid your research is and how exhaustive your research is. You know, because I spent six years on it, even if you ask me a question in my sleep, now I can stand up and give you an answer. Because, you know, it, it's all ingrained there now, including the dates, where I found the certain information, who told me what, which book gave me what. That, once you get at the back of your hand, then you get a degree of confidence in making a statement that you want to make. Good evening, sir. Sir, you talked about two things. One, when uh, Vedic gurus tried to imbibe uh, Shiva in the goddess story. Uh, same like you talked about the uh, uh, insurgents going at the uh, 
Naga land. You know, AFSPA has been uh, applied there from, since independence, uh, but nobody knows about this. The government is, uh, through embedded journalism, is doing so that nobody can know about it. Same is going in Kashmir, but everybody be here, every day we hear in news channels, Kashmir is this, Kashmir is this, Kashmir is Kashmir, is, Kashmir, is, Kashmir, is, Kashmir is, but nobody talks about the injunction going there in Naga Northeast, land. Yeah. Because they are, they are doing it so that nobody should know. So what's your take on that? See, it's, it's true because look at the country that, say, a Nehru inherited in 1947. You had states that wanted to split. There were princely states. Some of them wanted to be independent. Say, Hyderabad in the heart, right in the center of India. Imagine a country that wanted to be independent. You had crisis in Kashmir with, the, with Pakistan sending in invaders and so on. So you had a geopolitical problem there. You have a mass refugee uh, influx from the Punjab that's coming into India and people moving from there. You have violence breaking out in ba Bengal and places. The country is literally being created. I mean... The borders we have now, these are not historic borders. These borders never existed in the past. There were so many countries in this. It's a subcontinent. It's not really one country. So when you're making this one country, there were certain, let's say, hard choices they had to make, which necessarily were not ethically right. But to maintain the stability of the country at that time, a first prime minister said, nothing doing. If this is what it takes to maintain the borders, I have to do it. Otherwise, the whole country will split. Tamil Nadu will say, I want to become my own country because we have Tamils in, in Ceylon. We'll form our own uh, country across the sea and, you know, stay there. Uh, people in Punjab will say, why should we, you know, be part of the Indian Union? Travanco on the coast in the south said, we want to be independent. They even sent an ambassador to Pakistan. Uh, the Nizam was the richest man in the world. He was trying to buy Goa from the Portuguese for a price. He's willing to pay the Portuguese millions of rupees saying, give me the coast because that way at least I have access to the sea. And then he, had, he even had an air force. So at a time like that, a prime minister had to put his, his foot down and really uh, come up with somewhat stringent measures. It wasn't fair. It wasn't correct. And the fact that the insurgency is going on is our failure as a society and our failure as a democracy that we still have parts of this country where they have not had a single day of full democratic uh, power and right in the, in the people. But it is an issue that will take a long time to, to resolve. Where people and cultures and local, uh, when, when it's a local culture versus a national culture, it's never easy to choose between one or the other. It is, you know, a, a complex choice. So you, I wouldn't blame any government. I blame all governments for failing to resolve it. But, you know, one hopes that in future they will resolve it. Kashmir, of course, it's, it's difficult to resolve any time in the, in, in the near future because Kashmir has become an occupation for the Pakistani military. They've realized that having that as an excuse allows them to hold on a lot of power in Pakistan. So they want to keep that wound festering, you know. They want it to stay there as a sore wound because it's an excuse for anything else you want to do. So partly for that reason, even the enemy doesn't actually want peace there because they're like, Acha hai na, aise hai toh, we can retain all the power that we want. So there are no easy answers to this. And you know, while ethically it is very clear what needs to be done, when it comes to the reality of it, when a government is faced with actually coming up with solutions, they have no easy choices. All the choices are equally hard. So your choices are sleep with one devil or sleep with the other devil. But the options are only devils. There's no gods in this. Good evening, sir. Sir, uh, I have a question. Sir, uh, India had a uh, very beautiful past and we had uh, matriarchal society and uh, eunuch leaders, what I got to know now. So why is it uh, that we still consider LBGTQ as a taboo and uh, when we still have water wives in Rajasthan, so why is it still a taboo and when will we start accepting them? Uh, what, what happened was, you know, in the 19th century, we were a subject country. We didn't have independence. We were under the control of the British. And the British at that time were going through this Victorian phase where everything was about this Victorian notion of morality and purity and that sort of thing. So they started, essentially, I'm simplifying, but they started guilting Indians. You know, they started telling Indians, oh, we have to be here to rule because we are morally superior to you. So Indians will be like, what do you mean morally superior? So they'll say, oh, look, you're burning your widows in sati. Your uh, matrilineal women have three, three husbands. They don't even wear a blouse. They started guilting Indian communities, making, like, we started absorbing this massive sense of an inferiority complex that they were morally superior and we were morally inferior. Which meant that we started playing this game of trying to reach up to their levels of morality. It was a Victorian concept, it was not Indian. But we decided that to succeed and to gain equality with the British, we had to subscribe to their moral code. We had to, in a way, Victorianize ourselves to fit into their worldview because we were so enthralled by their power and their hold over our society. Colonialism wasn't merely political colonialism. It also colonized our minds. It also colonized the way we look at ourselves. Because what happened is the British came here, they built a mirror, 
And they held it up in front of us saying, this is your reflection. And we actually believed that reflection because at that time we didn't think of our own past. We were, you know, we had no confidence in ourselves. That hangover is still there. That hangover still exists in many of us. And it's, it, it, it's again one of those things that will take generations to go because it was so deeply internalized that we decided that we have to be more Victorian than the British themselves to succeed in the world. So we started saying only women, so, you know, matrilineal Kerala, women were all educated, they all owned property. Look at the earliest women's magazines that came out in this egalitarian society. The women's magazines actually said, we will not publish anything related to politics, economics. We will publish only things that energize the moral conscience. What do they mean? You must be a good wife, you must listen to your husband, you should stay in the kitchen, you should raise your children, don't go out, if you have property, give it to your husband. They, it was mentally ingraining it into these, or, or sort of engineering a social revolution, including in women, that what is ideal is this notion that women should be sati savitris, and you cannot own property, you cannot take decisions yourself, and it was internalized. Majorly in your Kerala, where a wedding was simply handing over a cloth in front of a lamp, and the woman tore the cloth afterwards, it was a divorce. That was a wedding ceremony. Now you go, you have Sindur, you have like this Mangal Sutra, you have rings. There are rituals that were invented to answer this inferiority complex that the British kept dinning into us. Their whole thing was, we are here to civilize India. So we said, Achha, to, we'll civilize ourselves, except we did it on their terms. And now we're realizing we should have done it on our terms. And if we do that, then LGBT would not be such a big issue. Because, you know, as I said, the Madurai goddess was an androgynous figure. Her gender was more or less neutral. She was neither female nor male. She was an, uh, a sort of midway uh, character. We have lots of stories like this in Indian history. Uh, Devdat Patnaik, I think, has written a book on, uh, on Shikhandi, it's called, specifically on homosexuality and so on. So if we look into our own past, if we look at the mirror that we build, we will discover that what we're seeking is actually the wrong thing. Uh, my name is Sumit. Sir, as an author, I want to know your view on whether there should be ban on books, leave alone a ban, whether there should even be censorship on books. No, what not at be? all. Because, I mean, the, the hallmark of any society that claims to be a democracy is that books should not be banned. The answer to a book is not banning it, it's to write another book. You know, it was, I think, Atal Bihari Vajpayee who said, if someone, if you don't like the length of a stick, you know, you draw a, a longer line. Why should you try to erase that line? You draw a better line, you draw a longer line, and you, you know, re, uh, reinterpret or retell the same thing, if you like, from your perspective. So books should never be banned. It's something we've done from the very start. One of the earliest books banned was by this man called Aubrey Menon, who I mentioned, his Irish mother. He wrote this book called uh, The Ramayana Retold. And in Nehru's time, and Nehru was a Democrat, even Nehru felt compelled to ban this book because basically it's a parody on the Ramayana. Basically, it's actually not a harmful book at all. It basically has things where Sita says, uh, you know, Ram says, we're going to exile tomorrow, and Sita's like, damn, you know, time for exile now. So it's just a little bit of a, a witty, sarcastic take on the Ramayana, but it was banned in the 1950s itself. It was one of the earliest books to be banned. All bans are wrong. The answer to a book is never a ban. The answer is a better book. So some years ago, you wrote a thesis by the name of Probing Hindu Nationalism. So I want, can you give a brief description about what that thesis was all about? It was about this quest. See, the Hinduism you have in Tamil Nadu is not the Hinduism you have in Gujarat. The Hinduism you have in Kashmir is not the Hinduism you will find in, say, Assam. Each of these places had a very distinct interpretation of religion. Everything was very localized. In fact, uh, a Malayali Muslim had more in common with a Malayali Hindu than he had with a Kashmiri Muslim. Uh, you know, the, he had nothing in common with the Nizam of Hyderabad. The Nizam of Hyderabad had nothing in common with a Muslim in Kashmir. Because even all these religions were extremely localized. In Kerala, there was this matrilineal Muslim royal family. As per Islamic law, it has to go in the male line. But there was actually a line where the women ruled, and they were called the Arakel Bivis. The Lakshadweep Islands belonged to them, and they had direct relations with the Ottoman emperors and Persians and so on. So my whole thing, the, the thesis it's essentially was looking at how these modern religious identities were cultivated and consciously generated in the 19th century. What happened in the 19th century is you have, finally, you have the British forming one common bo border and creating modern India in the sense we know, one common entity which meant, and, so, and you also have the English language. Never forget the irony that if it were not for the English language, a Gandhi born in Gujarat could never have talked to a Nehru born in Allahabad, who could never have talked to a Bose in Bengal, who could never have talked to a Raj Achari in uh, Tamil Nadu. They would not have had a common language. The elite had Sanskrit, but Sanskrit nobody spoke. It wasn't a language of discourse. So the English language united diverse Indians together. And the borders of the country also united them politically, which meant now you had a need for one pan-Indian Hinduism. You had a need for one pan-Indian religious identity. 
that's when there was a deliberate effort by social reformers from Raja Ramohan Roy onwards. He said, for example, all these social practices, caste, widow, uh, sati and so on, these are accretions that came later. He went back to the original book saying these are the principles and these principles are recognized across the country by all Hindus. Therefore, this is modern Hinduism. In a way, they were creating a new Hinduism for the modern age. Remember that the Hinduism that came with Shankaracharya is not the same as Vedic Hinduism. Similarly, the Hinduism that was born in the 19th century is not the same either as Shankaracharya's or Vedic Hinduism. It's a completely modern interpretation of Hinduism. So my thesis was basically looking at the politics of that, as to, at the political events and forces that led to the construction of the modern Hindu identity. Sir, I wanted to ask you a question that uh, today, we saw so much of a political news, everything that's happening. And whenever I try to understand what's happening, now I take interest in history that it must have happened before. So something like that will happen again. So you have read so much history from like uh, centuries ago. So are you able to uh, relate or able to analyze the thing that might happen in the future in the political terms or maybe in any human Na na nature. Yeah. So are you able to relate that thing through what you read about the past? You can't predict the future, obviously, yes, but, and as, they, but the, as the famous saying goes, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So yes, patterns in history that you've seen in the past can often repeat themselves. Yes. As I mentioned in the Harappa example, you know, it was climate change and mass unsustainable urbanization that eventually destroyed this civilization. Yes. We're seeing that the same pattern is recurring now. It's happened in the past. As I mentioned, Bijapur was a major city. Go there now, it feels like a small town. Yes. Who will believe that, you know, three centuries ago, you know, it was attracting the cream of the world itself who came there seeking opportunity, future, careers and so on. So these patterns keep repeating themselves and that can often teach you a lot. Why is it that, you know, there is this massive debate going on about constitutional democracy? There's a major debate going on because what did the constitution aim to do? It basically said in such a diverse country, you cannot force feed one brand of nationalism, one religion, one culture on all these people. People are divided by caste, religion, ethnicity, costume, culture, everything. So you have to create a platform where all these diversities can coexist in peace. Now, when you then see forces trying to create one pan-Indian version of nationalism, saying this is the right nationalism, that's the wrong one, this is a dangerous historical cycle because we know that from past episodes, whenever this has been attempted, whenever there's one man sitting on the top saying this, my way is the only way, you realize that forces from below emerge and they start tearing apart the whole entity. This is pretty much what happened with the Emperor Aurangzeb. Why is it that the Mughal Empire went into decline with him? Because he started force-feeding one version of empire, one version of state, and a very austere version of religion. He started a little bit of... He sure. became a dictator, kind of a dictator. Yeah, you be, I mean, it's not about dictators as much. It's about allowing only one thing to dominate, which meant that all these diversities from below will start pulling for their own rights, which means what? The country will break up. And we've seen this in the past. How do great empires collapse? And we must never forget that India is still a very new country. You know, 70 years of independence in the larger sweep of history is nothing. It's a blink of an eye, which means that this border, this state that you see now is not here to stay forever. Maybe not now, but 500 years from now, who knows what the map will look like? Who knows if this will be one country? Who knows it'll be, if there'll be five countries in this? You know, who knows if we'll be living in villages, as I said. So these, these cycles keep repeating themselves and we should be aware of them. I am Shubham Kumar. My question to you is that uh, I have read uh, in history book at the time of my schooling that the caste system in Hindu was defined on the basis of the work they do. Like Brahman, Brahmans uh, teaches, so they are, they are uh, called Brahmans and uh, the Kshatriyas, they fight. Oh, Manu Dharma, Manu Dharma. Yeah, it was called Manu, Manu Dharma, yeah. Yes, sir. So I want to ask you that uh, the, as the section of the society was defined on the basis of their work, how does it define us on now as a core? As a? As a core, now it becomes the core of the, our religion. So how does it become the, from the work to now they are defining who is better, who is worse? There, there are two things to this. You know, the, the Chaturvarnya system as you see in say the Manusmriti or in the official text, in reality that never existed. In reality it was never one, two, three, four castes. It, wasn't, it was never Brahmin, Kshatriyas, Vaishya, Shudras. Banaras alone had, a, I don't know, 64 kinds of Brahmins of various sub-castes. And none of these Brahmins would eat with each other. None of these Brahmins had the same customs. They all had different identities. So within one caste alone you have hundreds of jatis across this country. And as you go down the, the ladder, you discover that these, this official sequence of castes never existed in practice. One of my favorite stories is how Indian kings, once they became powerful, 
they would come say from the peasant caste like they were just sons of the soil their ancestors were farmers who became village heads who became military men and then one descendant eventually becomes king now this king says that as per chaturvarna i want to wear the the punul or the sacred thread and i want to be called a kshatriya and the brahmin said okay fine let's invent a ritual for you so one of the best rituals is where uh, the brahmins would go out and they would find a cow uh, a cow with all the auspicious uh, signs and then this cow would, would be brought to the court and a gold model of this cow would be created entirely in gold and then it was a massive structure you know entire human being could fit inside it the king who wants to become a kshatriya who is till then you know just a regular peasant caste he will enter the cow from the mouth he'll sit inside the cow for say one hour and the brahmins will chant mantras for birth and then he'll emerge from the tail of the cow reborn as a kshatriya so you know caste was something that could be manipulated in madurai when the king landed out of the cow like this he landed in the lap of the brahmin priest's wife who bawling like a baby he was told that you have to cry like a baby and the brahmin's wife fed him milk because you know he was being reborn so caste was actually something that could be changed the moment a community gained political power or it gained economic status its caste status could rise the kayasthas are a famous example you know they rose to prominence because they were scribes and their access to power gave them a degree of prestige by which they, sh they shot up the british in their censuses you know there were there are these funny cases in the Uh, late 19th century where in one census they will say oh this caste is a very low caste then the caste will protest for 10 years saying no 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 we are this and we are much better and so on and the next sex census the british will upgrade the caste and say sorry this caste is actually a higher caste so it all depended on how much power you had how much economic influence you had and if you had both these together you could always upgrade your caste it was always something that kept shifting in general they were brahmins but the status of a kshatriya was very much open anybody could overnight uh, become a kshatriya you so long as you found the right brahmins and the right rituals and the right golden cow you can become a kshatriya so these things kept changing quite a bit good evening my name is krishna manmadan so my question to you is i would love it if you could share your experience of working in the office with dr shashi tarur <laughs> because i have always been following him since my childhood and he is the kind of public speaker i aspire to be another thing uh, you know the famous speech and the debate he did in britain Oxford. where he says british should pay for the kind of harm that has been done to india so i would like to know your view regarding that on the on the british and the payment thing he actually says that he wants a symbolic reparation symbolic of 1 rupee. rupee no he doesn't want money from them because yes. india doesn't need their money we don't want them to you know fund our government or anything the country is perfectly capable of standing on its own feet yes. the point of a 1 rupee token this thing is it's a larger principle it's an acknowledgement that we made a mistake and we are therefore acknowledging the mistake by giving you this 1 rupee it's a 1 rupee token simply to commemorate an entire society an entire nation suffering it's not about the money so okay, i i pretty much align with that if reparations ever were to be paid it would have to be symbolic it would have to be an acknowledgement rather than any financial thing we don't need in fact you know the government of india often spends more money and our budgetary allocations are often pretty much at the same level as uh, you know these western european countries now especially as we are growing now so it's not about the money so we pretty much align on that one point yes sir in terms of working with him i actually started working with him after my masters it was my first job i was 21 years old in 2011 and uh, it was quite random frankly the way it all worked out because i was flying back from london to bombay and he was on the other side catching the flight to delhi and i studied international relations so i thought oh you know i've got my writing to do which i can do on the side and my research and so on but what will i do as a as a day job and i thought let me just email him and ask for an internship and then he actually read the email and he liked the way i wrote he liked the way i had drafted the email and then we got talking and he said you know why don't you come down to trivandrum because that's his constituency yes. and my family is also from kerala so we were on the way there anyway so i met him in trivandrum and uh, he said look why don't you join me in the delhi office and you know run the the delhi office there obviously for a 21 year old it was an exciting yes. offer imagine running shashi tharoor's office it's a dream uh, come true it yeah it was pretty much like that and uh, i have ended up there with you know it was me doing the parliamentary research parliamentary questions speeches you know uh, yes. managing the office itself and all i had was one clerk and the clerk was a gentleman in his 60s who thought ye kon hai bachcha aaya hai mujhe kya sikhayega and he sort of did his own thing so it was a great opportunity for me because suddenly i was dealing with diplomats one meeting dealing with political constituents who came there seeking a pension from the prime minister's fund i was uh, dealing with ngos i was dealing with some of the finest brains who were coming to see my boss because i could sit in on all these meetings yeah. so for an entire year i got access to all this and i realized that this is actually something i want to do it's actually great fun it's not at that time you know the government salaries are never very uh, flattering they're actually quite yes sir embarrassing <laughs> but 
Um, the point is, you know, you do it because you enjoy doing that. You do it because you want to be part of something bigger than yourself. And that's what I was getting there. I knew I would ne- not get on that salary at the time. I wouldn't get a fancy car or, you know, any of that. But I didn't want that fancy car. I wanted to be there in the thick of this, go to parliament to see how debates were playing out, to hear the, the research I had produced for a speech when he, you know, gave that speech in parliament. It was, it was I was also being part of that conversation. Nice. The parliamentary questions that were, the, that were formulated, you know, private member bills that he was introducing. These are things that can potentially affect the legislation of an entire country. 1.3 billion people could potentially be affected by these events in parliament. So I was part of something much more uh, bigger than what a, a normal 21-year-old at that time could get. And that was not an opportunity I was going to let go. So in 2012, I left because he was becoming a mantri. And I realized that when you become a mantri, the IAS officers come in and then they run the show. Yeah. So I said, I don't want to become a second fiddle to anybody. So then I went back to London, which is when I worked at the House of Lords. And then I did my stint with the BBC. I came back for his election campaign in Trivandrum in 2014, where I was handling the press and social media and so on. Then in 2015, I went back to him. And then he's also chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. And I have a, an international relations background as well. So I became chief of staff eventually. And I was there till last August, which is when I decided I have to leave because uh, it was very demanding. Like I was, in any case, sleeping only five hours a day. I had to do my column on the side for the paper. I had to run uh, nine in the morning to 10 in the night job do my writing on the side, sacrificing sleep. And I realized that I would only be able to do my second and third books if I made the time for myself. So I've taken a 2017 to 2019 election break. And then I'll go back to him in the elections and help him in the elections. But till then, I have a writer's break focusing only on my research. So actually, we all are totally overwhelmed and uh, a bit taken aback by your credentials and that to which you attained at your 20s. So being an economic guy uh, dealing with micro and macro economics, suddenly there was a spurring force in you which led you towards historical writings. So sir, you might have faced some of the other types of difficulties. Uh, what were your teething troubles? I would say teething troubles which uh, you overcome at, at the end. Luckily, I was always interested in history. So it wasn't a completely fresh like jump start for me. Because I had an interest in history, I only enjoyed doing it. My only regret is that now I've essentially forgotten all my economics. If you ask me, if you give me an economics job, I will have no idea what to say. You ask me an economic principle, I've forgotten. I had a distinction in those days, but you're only as good as you practice. It's a little bit like writing. Your writing only develops and evolves if you keep doing it. If you let it rest for 10 years, you lose it. Because at the end of the day, it's not merely an art, it's also a craft. And all crafts need to be perfected. So the shift to history wasn't entirely um, you know, dramatic or difficult because I was enjoying the process, I enjoyed the stories. What was interesting was my master's, I had to do a thesis, the Hindu nationalism one. And that gave me, that equipped me with the tools to figure out how to do research. So I started figuring out how to work in archives, how to deal with documents, how to gauge the reliability of one source versus the reliability of another source. It gave me the skills that can be applied across fields. I chose to apply it to history. So that was really the more interesting part of it, rather than the shift from one subject to the other. That didn't, that wasn't much of a challenge. Uh, so my question is about the Aryan invasion theory, uh, because uh, recently in Economic Times there has been a news that uh, Aryans had not uh, migrated from anywhere and they were the local Indians. So what's your take on this? And the second question is, sir, Ramayan, Ma- Ramayan and Mahabharata, facts or a mythology? So your take. So on the, on the Aryan invasion, I think it's pretty clear now there was no invasion. Like it wasn't one massive army that suddenly entered India and said, Achha, now we are going to be the Aryans here. It was, a, it was something that happened over a stretch of time. You know, people came into India from Central Asia over a certain period of time. The issue is very political because, um, you know, Hindutva Vadis, for example, especially the extreme fringe groups, their whole argument against Muslims is you came from outside, you are foreigners. But if the Aryan theory, immigration theory proves that even the Aryans, the early Brahmins came from outside, then, you know, how can you call someone else a foreigner? How can you call a, a, a Bavar a foreigner when even the ancestors of Hindus came from outside the country? So it's a very political subject. The answer to it comes from genetics because they've discovered uh, skeletons and so on and the DNA tests are revealing a great deal. So all Indians are descended from what is called ancestral South Indian and ancestral North Indian. The original Indians, like the people who are originally here first, right from the start are the people you find in the Andamans, the Gonds, uh, the Gond tribes, they are, that's why they're called Adivasis. They were the first people in this land. Then you have a certain influx of people coming in from Persia, that side. They're not modern day Persians, but that part of the world. That is what led to what is called the ancestral South Indian population. 
Then you have what is called the Aryans, the Central Asians coming in in a much different period, which is what led to the ancestral North Indian. So genetically, what they call a UP Tiwari has the highest degree of the Central Asian foreign blood. Whereas, say, a, a Tamilian will have a relatively lower degree of it. Both have it because these populations have married till 2000 years ago. Th that's something historians haven't figured out why 2000 years ago Indians established this caste system and stopped intermarrying. Till then, there was this constant mix of blood. So all Indians have all kinds of blood in them, which this genetics thing is proving. And as the debate evolves, as the facts from science come in, then we'll know for sure which theory is uh, more true and which one is possibly a fiction, a figment of someone's imagination. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, you are, you are the author, and from author to uh, public, uh, sorry, public policy professional, two entirely different fields. Uh, so uh, comes in hand in hand for you. So I want to know. So it was a part of your plan, or it just? Yeah, I I, I won't say it was a part of any grand plan. I did, however, have a yearly plan. For example, all my moves. I worked in Delhi, went back to London, came back to Delhi. These moves were guided by my book because I was working on my first book and that when I needed the British archives, I went back to London. When I needed the National Archives in Delhi, I found a job and came back to Dr. Tharoor in, in Delhi and worked with him. So I realized that you know, I could align my plans together. So I did, make a certain, I did do a certain amount of planning, but it was on a yearly basis rather than some grand plan. At 20, if you asked me where I'd be at 28, I had no idea. I mean, I was pretty much a confused kid who was like, Achha, I want to do one book and I've got an idea. And I want to work with this MP, but beyond that, you know, who knows what tomorrow holds. And it's similar now. If you ask me what I'm going to do two years from now, I could say I'll still be writing because I don't think the, the writing is ever going to go anywhere, anywhere, you know, far away from me. But I have no grand plan. I don't know what I'm going to do at 40. I don't know what I'm going to do at 50. And I don't want to really uh, chart some sort of plan and like fix these rigid goals because life is also a, a journey and you have to take it with its ups and downs. So, you know, right now, uh, Colonel Bala has these wonderful things to say. Two years from now, maybe I'll write some terrible book and everyone will be, have these scathing reviews and I'll disappear from the face of the earth, which is also something you have to live through because you have to collect these experiences and you have to enrich yourselves as a person as well and not merely set and establish plans because plans have this inconvenient habit of not working out. So it's better to have realistic plans. Uh, oh no, I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. See, one of your interviews I have seen that you know, after publishing the first book, you said you were looking very uh, <coughs> You are going to take a break, you said. I don't know whether you are really taking a break, I don't know. You forgot you were taking a break. What is you doing that that one time? That one year or something like that, you are saying I'm going to take a break. Huh. That, that is something, well, technically, so I've realized that I don't want to break break in the sense that I don't want to sit at home doing nothing, which is why I frankly enrolled for a PhD, because I realized a PhD gives me space for three years to do my research on the other hand. It takes away the pressure of having a job. My columns give me my regular income, which goes into my bank account. So I realized this is a break for me. I'm sitting in London. I'm spending all day, essentially from nine in the morning till eight when the library shuts with my books, with my archival material collecting data like a maniac for my next book. And, you know, I'm going to do that for my one-year break. That's my so-called one-year break. Then I'll come back to India at some point and I'll sit down and write the book, which will be a six-month process, which is when I'll probably have no job, nothing, and I will focus only on finishing the book. Uh, because books, uh, you know, you really have to invest the kind of time... Otherwise, you end up with a shoddy bad book. And the problem with the book is that once it's out, it never goes away. It'll haunt you for life. Uh, it, it's always on your record. So I have to make sure that the quality of the research, the quality of the writing is of the highest level possible simply because it's my name that's going on the cover. It's my credentials, my reputation that's very hard earned that's going on the cover. So I can't take uh, a shortcut. I have to make the time. I have to accept maybe even a loss of money. And I have to realize that, you know, that's how I want to spend my free time. I am a Ferguson graduate too. And I am from a Tarsil where Shivaji Maharaj is born. So I am grown up by seeing the festival of celebration of Shivaji Maharaj's birth every year. And I am seeing it growing uh, like every year. So I am, I, what I uh, saw is the depth of history is being hidden under uh, su the, these superficial things. So what is your view on it? It's, see, one issue that's happened to Shivaji is he's this fascinating character who had yes. so many wonderful sides to him. Yes. But politicians have reduced him to one particular kind of person. And the thing is, because politics is involved, even historians are scared to fully say things freely. Because you don't know who'll beat you up or who'll say what. Because, you know, nobody's 
interest i mean historians are interested in the historical figure in his context in his time politicians are in, interested in using shivaji as political capital to exploit him every now and then and for their own purposes for their own ideologies for their own agendas and because of that it becomes challenging for anybody to really uh, do a completely thorough investigation of him it's sad but you know it's also the reality we have to live with so some scholars do try and you know go the extra mile but they have to do it very cautiously make sure nobody is offended that is to say people are never offended normally lay readers have no issues yes. ordinary people have fairly open minds it's always the political class that th there was this controversial uh, scholar called james lane he's actually made some mistakes in his research but that's not the point the point is when his book became controversial a rather obscure organization went to the bandarkar institute destroyed manuscripts set things on fire completely vandalized the place why did they do it because by doing something so aggressive they got their prime time news coverage overnight this organization nobody had heard about became like this big force and now everyone scared of them so politicians have also realized that using history to make some sort of a grand entry on the political stage is a very convenient way don't do any work just go beat up some people and you'll get your press that's the reality we live with but you know that doesn't mean historians stop uh, investigating history that's something we still do and hopefully we won't get beaten up for it uh, so, so what so is uh, this book of yours which is going which is you going to publish will change something from no because uh, luckily i mean shivaji appears only at the end the book is called rebel sultans a decan from khilji to shivaji so shivaji is not even the last chapter he's the epilogue he's the essay at the end mm -hmm. and my entire book is basically a narrative saying what led to shivaji why did a shivaji emerge at that particular moment with that particular ideology and that particular vision because it's not like he woke up one fine morning and said i want to do this mm -hmm. there are lots of historical currents his mother's influence his father's political career his grandfather's role working with the african malik ambar all these things shaped shivaji and that complexity is what i want to look so i'm not looking at shivaji per se mm -hmm. i'm looking at the four centuries before him that eventually led to that space where a shivaji could emerge would you like to do something to put this character in front of like people because in education too uh, like from 8 to 10 people are people from maharashtra like student from maharashtra are learning this in history and then they are forgetting after 10 so would you like <laughs> to do something that's why i've written the book in the hope that you know people like yourself will pick it up people yes. who have an interest will pick it up and realize that you know this is uh, what we want to read uh, good evening sir uh, we are really happy uh, uh, to see you as a guest speaker here and uh, i won't be asking you any uh, per, uh, professional question about your career like about any history i would be asking you a personal question because i was uh, i feel really blessed to have attended your father's uh, session or workshop which was conducted by him and uh, in that he said that uh, during uh, your childhood uh, you were not allowed to watch tv oh, okay. uh, and uh, so because of that you got the habit of uh, reading books and uh, you as well as your sister I, if i'm not mistaken uh, so from being an ardent book reader to uh, the uh, an author and columnist so how this been how the phase been to you and uh, what's your your take on it and how you feel that uh, was that decision of avoiding tv and reading books was the best decision and it it was not a decision i took because i was 7 yeah. years old and <laughs> it i still remember that morning it was one ancient tv in those days we didn't have flat screens and so on it was one of those ancient tvs and in those days the it was a cable connection so there's a very thick wire that used to connect to the tv from the oh. terrace and uh, it was 7:30 in the morning or something and I, instead of getting ready for school i was sitting and watching cartoon network uh, not so surprising for a 7 year old kid my father was very upset when he saw this 7:30 a.m. cartoon network thing so he simply went to the terrace cut it off and essentially put it in a plastic bag and said enough no more tv and then after that we were allowed to watch one bbc film every week and every week we'd go to the british council library here which used to be on ferguson college road pick up uh, normally these were i mean they were series that had gone that was from the 70s you know things like the to the manor born or the good life or there was this 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 show called the duchess of duke street which i as a child thought was a comedy but in reality it was a very serious uh, show because that's the stuff we were exposed to and we started watching these uh, film versions of lots of old classical english books so charles dickens david copperfield for example or jane austen's novels these we started watching on screen as mini series as uh, films and so on and this meant that as soon as we finished watching it we'd go and look for the book to read the original book yeah. 
So then we started picking up the, uh, the, the habit of reading. And, you know, uh, my sister played a big role as well because she was initially the bigger reader than I was. And, you know, in a, in a family where your father doesn't allow you to watch TV and your sister's always reading, some point you also end up picking up a book. Right. And then, you know, that's how it started. So I'm actually grateful for him for going up and violently cutting that cable, cable TV thing. It felt very excessive at the time. And I was like, why do I have a father like this who wants to cut, <laughs> cut my TV? But now that I think of it in retrospect, it was probably the wiser thing to have done at that time. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And a pleasure talking to you. Honorable Chief Guest, Mr. Manu S. Pillai, beloved Bala sir, our most esteemed faculty members and student managers, I, Nishant Kumar, on behalf of the entire fraternity present here today, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to our respected Chief Guest, Mr. Manu S. Pillai, for sharing with us such exceptional knowledge and acumen. A warm thank you to you, sir, for such a knowledgeable talk. Whether it is the new insights provided to read history in new ways or various stories from almost every region of India, I'm sure all of us, student managers and all those present here have a lot to take away from the speech. We are all very inspired by your great words. Also, I'd like to thank our beloved Bala sir for providing us this platform where we interact with such distinct personalities. And I'd like to thank everyone for their involvement and active participation. Sir, once again, I'd like to state that we are all most grateful to you. We thank you for being with us this evening. It has been a great pleasure. Thank you very much.